G'day and welcome back to BinRx. Last week we had 60 of you over to our place to do some brainstorming about cool stuff we could send to space together. But the way we set that activity up, not all of you would have had a chance to hear from all of our engineers and not all of our engineers would have had a chance to see all of your ideas. So today we're going to fix that. We're going to run a little mini mission concept review with our engineers. I've got a big pile of your designs right here and I have a whole bunch of excited spacecraft engineers over there who can't wait to take a look at them. This isn't just for fun though, it's all about getting some feedback. So if you've watched Stuart and Fergus's video about how we go to space, you'll know that every single step of our spacecraft design process ends in a review. We might be the first to make spacecraft here in Western Australia, but we're definitely not the first people to make spacecraft ever. And that means it's really, really important for us and for you to learn as much as we can from the people who have already done this. So I hope this video is a little bit of fun and I hope it's a chance for you to see some of each other's ideas, but I also want you to pay attention to how our engineers are giving feedback. Ready? Let's go. Just for a little bit of background, this is Kyle. Um, Kyle, what's your PhD about? So my PhD is using compliant mechanisms to create deployable structures and allow more capable small spacecraft. Cool. So it's like it's like stuff that pops out of the the side of the satellite, or it's like stuff that that like moves around inside the satellite. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Excellent. How do you feel about a grappling hook? Ooh, <laughs> see, I like this idea. Um, oh, it says it's for space cleanup. So this is interesting. This is like an actual thing that was tested. Um, no, that's not true. There was no grappling hook. There was a spear. Um, anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? There was a spear? So they tried out a net um, as like a, you know, capturing the space debris and another one was firing a harpoon, a space harpoon out of a small satellite to, to catch some space debris. But, you know, a similar idea. It had a hook on the end, so basically a grappling hook. Sick. I really do like this idea because it's, you know, it's dealing with a really important um, issue in space at the moment. Yeah. And also like a... Uh, you know, it came up with a solution that has been one in people's minds before and has been tested or as uh, they've... They've tested something they've, similar. They've tested something yeah. similar. Yeah, they've That's gone, pretty cool. Yeah, taken steps towards implementing it. So, yeah, I really like this idea. It's very clever, whoever came up with this. Problem we're trying to solve. Humans cannot physically survive in space. Cool problem. What's the, what's the payload? How are they going to solve that? What data do we need to answer that question? How DNA is affected by radiation? What components do we need to collect that data? Different DNA samples. It's very similar to biosentinel, and that's why they're using yeast on biosentinel because it's very similar to humans. It's a cool idea. It's kind of already been done. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't be done again. But yeah, I think the main the main thing you need to be able to do is tell when like the DNA chain has changed. I would imagine that an easy way to well, I say easy as if it is easy at all, but uh, to analyze the differences would be to have a control sample of the. DNA that's being sent, and then have the stuff that went to space returned. I think they're doing the tests in space. With what, like spectroscopy? Yeah, kind of those are instruments, medical instruments. Interesting. So that's where it gets interesting. There you go. Yeah. Cool, cool idea, nonetheless. Cool idea. Bushfires is the problem. Bushfires. A lot of those in Australia. What are the main locations of bushfires in Australia? Okay, like repeat locations. Well, no, they've got a camera here. Thermal management system. Pretty typical on spacecraft. I, don't, I guess they would have to take care of that. They've learned from the vacuum chamber testing that we did, which is really good. So, yes, if you have a camera, you need a way of regulating the heat on it so it doesn't go fuzzy. Mm. Uh, you've got a thermal camera as well, so usually using typically using an infrared camera, which is really good for that sort of stuff. But again, at the same time, uh, when you're measuring the uh, temperature of something from space using thermal uh, imaging or infrared cameras. Uh, you're sitting at like, what, 400 kilometers up from the surface of Earth. You're looking through f quite a lot of atmosphere, you know, 100 kilometers or so of atmosphere. And so if you're using thermal cameras, what exactly is it that you're measuring? You know, are you mm. going to be picking up the temperature of the gas in the, the atmosphere? Of the clouds, as well. clouds, things like that, that that's affecting that. So um, that's not to say it's not possible. It would just be quite a tricky thing. But um, a bit of filtering in terms of filtering. Images. Filtering could be an interesting one. It's a really cool idea. Um, I personally would love to send a camera to space and I think it'd be a great payload for students to work on. Mm -hmm. How to have moving parts on a satellite without causing unwanted rotation. Seems to be using like some reaction wheels as well as uh, you know, your moving components. This is a really cool idea so far. Um, so the question is how do we have moving movement on a satellite without causing rotation? It's a really valid question. That happens with binar when the antennas deploy, right? Yeah, like when, absolutely. When the anten antennas spring out of the side, it, like the whole satellite starts to spin. Yeah, so uh, 
because we got really uh, like a really slow spin on bin R1, we use magnet talkers to um, to counteract that. But if you have anything bigger than that, like a robotic arm, uh, you're going to have uh, other issues, which looks like what they're addressing. Okay, so this is sort of like a uh, figuring out the response of the satellite to you know what's going on inside the satellite, and from that information, then we can uh, use some clever maths to uh, figure out how to counteract it. Which is yeah, I really like this like a control systems problem, which is a Always a fun subject for uh, engineers. What problem are we trying to solve? Temperature changes in the ocean, the poles, and glaciers. OK. Uh, the question is, how hot is the ocean? Is it increasing? I'm going to probably uh, say, yeah, it is a little bit. How do you know? Because we're going to have a payload that's going to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so what, terms do, uh, what data do we need to answer that question? Obviously, we need temperature of the water in different locations. Uh, and then components like cameras and thermal imaging and that type of yeah, stuff. all the classic. But yeah, but, but no, I, I, I definitely think this is something that is achievable. Um, yeah, definitely. What we're doing. Yeah. Um, it's also a camera idea again, which I think is pretty cool. The lifetime of a CubeSat mission, um, the orbits that we're in, we're looking at two years, uh, kind of at the best case scenario. This is really one of those things that you're going to have to, I guess, fall back to a lot of the data that has been collected in the past couple decades from uh, low Earth orbiters that are looking at temperatures in, in the oceans. And then, yeah, seeing seeing if you can get some changes from that. You know, if you go onto Google Earth right now, you can see pictures of glaciers. If you, you can even actually go back in the past couple of decades of pictures of glaciers. You could um, potentially reference that against some, some of the images that come back from, from the satellite mm -hmm. um, payloads such as this. That's, That's good. probably yeah. a good idea. Nice job. Thanks, one. Hot wheels in space. See, this is an idea I hadn't thought of yet. It's like sending oh, the Tesla to space, but much, much smaller. That's it. So yeah, so you know, <laughs> well, you don't need your whole own rocket company. We just throw it up in a small cube yeah, Just get Jeez. a smaller car, Elon. Yeah, jeez. Uh, so to collect this data, they're using a camera, um, ones that we use for hospitals. So I think they mean like an endoscope, like one of the really teeny tiny ah. ones. So it's, it's small enough to fit in a cube set. Right. Uh, that's that's my. <laughs> that was my interpretation of that. Yeah, that would, uh, and then because you have everything self-contained within the in the um, the payload bay itself. Yeah, that's, uh, that's clever. Then, of course, uh, to collect the data, we're going to have to move our um, our hot wheels car around in some way and see how well we can control it. I suppose that way, you know, if it works inside the chassis, because the environment inside is more or less the same as out it is outside, uh, we can see whether it works as a way of flying through space. Actually. I, I kind of hope this is the one that gets chosen <laughs> <laughs> so, to be honest. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I, I'm like, let's, let's do it. Give it over to Ben to see what he thinks, but I reckon he'll be down for <laughs> some Hot Wheels in space. Excellent. Uh, so this one's basically looking at uh, answering the question, how much light we use compared to how much light we actually need. Well, that's a really interesting topic to, to look at. Um, so looking at using cameras, light sensors, heat sensors, interesting. Uh, but that's that's a genuine problem for sure. Um, it's, it's not really something that we know the full extent of yet, I would mm. probably argue. I think, I think that's, that's the other thing as well. It's something that, like, I guess the question of is there a lot of negatives of light pollution? I guess we don't really know a lot of it. Like, sure, there's some probably effects on wildlife and like, oh, definitely. like definitely, human yeah. life, especially, like in terms of how you behave in the lit up nighttime situations. The, the certain fields like astronomy that, that does suffer from mm. light pollution, you yeah. now have to drive a few hours out of a CD, uh, CBD to, to be able to actually see the stars, things like that. Um, but it's interesting what, what you were saying before with uh, wildlife. Um, mm. We kind of, you know, go to bed when we want to, get up when we want to kind of deal, but um, animals are definitely really heavily ingrained in that circadian rhythm. And if it's light when it shouldn't be light, you know, I, I can see how that could potentially yeah. have a long yeah. lasting impact. Yeah, I, just, I thought it was a really cool idea just to sort of you could do an analysis and, and just like do like a tiled analysis and if you don't need like a high resolution you can uh. just do like a star tracker sort of type camera sure you're only looking at the dark parts of the earth which means you can charge on the other parts and you're really just trying to get like that like resolution of like 10 by 10 meter squares and uh. like zero to one the light level and go from there forward i think it's really cool and it's a really good use for a set of data that can maybe be used in the future to really measure a few things we don't know about yet. So, yeah. so this is more just about collecting that data from space to connect, collect the light pollution data and then see how we can compare that to on the ground data sets to get some scientific output or just have a bit of fun with cameras and send something to space. So I think it's a really good application that actually has probably a lot of meaning to it and it's quite simple to do in space and something that I've never seen really done before. So it's cool.
Nice job. I was part of this one. I can tell. To test if there is bacteria in space, yep. fishing in space. Yeah. So... <laughs> is there bacteria in space? <laughs> I was part of this one, right? I was part of this group. Uh, so they, they essentially wanted to look at, and it's a fair question. It was, will stuff rot in space? And the, the question they came to the table with initially was, will a stick rot in space or a piece of wood rot in space? Um, and we had essentially come to the conclusion that what actually causes things to rot, you know, you're looking at your moisture, your temperature, uh, and also bacteria that, are, that may be present on the organic sample. Um, but when... Uh, right, so if wood doesn't rot in space, then there's no bacteria on it because it's all dead. There's yeah, no so, so they were looking at sterilizing, but this is where the fishing comes in. So the idea was to have a open part of the satellite, right, with like a piece of net or something that allows the outside, the vacuum of space, into the satellite. And the idea would be... Well, our satellite's not a sealed vessel. Yeah, so... A, so a but but no, 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 I understand that it's not sealed, but you, you have to have some holes to let the bugs in. <laughs> so, so they want to go bug fishing in space. They want to go bug fishing in space. They want to see if they can have a sterilized piece of organic material that will begin to rot in space, which could potentially uh, infer that there are anaerobic bacteria in low Earth orbit that can be collected onto an organic sample and cause rotting. Hey, look. It's wacky, but it's plausible. So maybe that's why NASA doesn't use wood in space. Do you think they've ever sent wood to space? No, actually, it makes sense now, yeah, yeah. yeah why don't you build a CubeSat out of wood? You're the engineer, you tell me. Well, you put it on a vibration table, it'll immediately snap. I don't know, I reckon you can get good enough wood. Like, jar is pretty good. Jar is pretty good. I hear we actually have a bit of Jara in WA, you know? Yeah, a little bit, actually. WA, born and like satellite. It. Let's send uh, Jara to space. Yeah, it could work. Can yeah, so, wood so be used as a structural material? Here we go. I think you uh, might have helped these guys to do theirs. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, no. It's going to come back to haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I did have a hand in this. Um, what's, should... what's the question, Kyle? So, the problem we were trying to solve, one of the biggest problems facing mankind, not enough giraffes in space. <laughs> I feel this one, it's really close to home because, you know, I personally have wanted to see giraffes in space my entire life. And uh, now, now we can try it out. So the, the science question itself is what is the, you know, how does the behavior of a giraffe change in a, a space environment? The components we need for this is uh, infrared imaging. So that's... Yeah. We want to tell how warm the giraffe is, yep. Exactly. So we're going to have motion sensors to figure out where the giraffe is. Very important. Um, that could be you know, applied to our Hot Wheels car as well. So the question I had and, and a few other, other people had is the, why specifically a giraffe? Um, mm. But um, my thought was its long neck would be, in, you know, it might have something uh, interesting about it because that's yeah. probably, you know, affected by gravity having a, having a long neck. But totally. Like, what, it, what it makes me think of is when you put cats in zero G, they right. use their tails at, to like, to control their angular momentum. That's how uh -huh. they always stay the right way up. It's like the whole giraffe is just one big reaction wheel. I feel like it hasn't gone far enough, to be honest. I think we need to put a giraffe and then compare it to like, a horse or a zebra, and you know, same thing, but shorter neck. Yeah, you need a control. Come. Exactly. We need to we need to see the effects of the long neck on <laughs> spacefaring capabilities. I guess still might be a little bit hard to get past Ben and, and the rest of the team. But like, <laughs> what about like a centipede versus a, a beetle or something? You know, it's the same yeah. proportion, and that'll Some, fit in the cubesat. Yeah. And then you know, the beetle can drive the Hot Wheels car around in, in, in the cockpit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very for, much uh, for, for that. Um, <laughs> Yes, and thank you all for your amazing ideas. I have thoroughly enjoyed reading them and, 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 and honestly impressed by the, the ideas that you guys have come up with. This is, this is really cool. Yeah, me too. I, they're, they're all so good. All of them are, all of them are excellent. <laughs> all right, so what did you notice about the way our engineers did feedback? I'll give you a second to think about it, but there's two things that I noticed in particular. One thing that I noticed was that they're always positive. They always looked for the good in an idea, how we can make it work, even if it was a little bit silly. And that's the way feedback should be. Sometimes it can be disappointing to hear that an idea has been done before or that it might not work, but it should never be mean. It should never feel cruel. And that kind of brings me to the other thing that I noticed, which is how often they brought up other missions that they knew about that had done the same thing. As I said at the start, we are not the first people to send things into space by any means, and we need to draw on as much of that knowledge as we can. And for our engineers, that means having a really good working knowledge of other spacecraft missions. Now it's your turn. 
I've attached the full set of designs from our mission concept day in the description. I want you to grab them, grab a friend, uh, and make a little feedback video of your own for one of those designs. It doesn't have to be super slick or super long, but it does have to be constructive. That means we're looking for the things we can improve or the things that we do like about an idea. And we need to do a little bit of research as well. So if there's another mission that has done the same thing, I wanna hear about it. I wanna know who's done it, where it was done, when it was done, and what we can learn from what they did, especially if it didn't work. Everything you need should be down there in the description, and I can't wait to see you react to each other's designs.